Over the past 35 years, Final Fantasy has continued to grow and evolve as a franchise. That sentiment is as true now as it was when Hironobu Sakaguchi worked with his team on Final Fantasy II, as they tried to figure out how they could create a new version of Final Fantasy that would be transformative as opposed to iterative. Since that point, the ongoing mission has always been to push boundaries, and not be afraid to do so, and that mission has been evidenced with every major Final Fantasy game. Even though there are clear similarities, it means each game has featured its own vision for how things should look, how it should play, and what type of story should be told. It means we've seen countless battle systems, progression mechanics, thematic settings, narrative arcs, and musical scores. But there has always been one constant, outside of the games utilising the Final Fantasy name, that even if not every change landed, there would always be some positives to take. And it would often be those positives that would appeal to a new wave of fans who saw something in that specific title that they perhaps felt was missing before. Quite often, these changes have been most pronounced whenever new consoles have been involved. The likes of Final Fantasy IV, VII and X each presented bold new visions for what Final Fantasy should be, drawing in waves of new fans upon their respective launches due to, in part, those bold new visions. Final Fantasy XVI is taking the same approach. Based on this, it means the development team is acutely aware that Final Fantasy XVI will not appeal to everyone, but the development team working on Final Fantasy VII would have surely felt the same way too, as they took the decision to make wholesale changes compared to Final Fantasy VI. All they can do is hope that what they've poured their hearts and souls into will still be appealing nonetheless, exceeding expectations and winning detractors over due to the quality of what's on offer. Talk is cheap however, and as we showed within a recent video where we ran through the sentiments of thousands of fans, there's doubt and uncertainty amongst various pockets of the fanbase. Some of this is due to the initial reveal not landing quite as well as would have been hoped, but the firm stance of the development team around turn-based gains being a thing of the past has also served to ostracise. It's also not helped so far that all we've had to go on to understand what 16 is all about is a handful of interviews and four short trailers each focused on something different. But that then points to the subject of this video, as we were very fortunate to go hands-on with Final Fantasy 16. Yes, you heard correctly, we have played the game, it's real. And over the next 20 to 30 minutes, we'd encourage you to strap yourselves in and get cosy, as we're about to explore Final Fantasy 16 with a level of granularity that has never been seen before anywhere. Much has been said about the lineage of the development team working on Final Fantasy 16. To those who don't play Final Fantasy 14, many of the individuals that form the Final Fantasy 16 leadership team may feel unfamiliar, as they either haven't been involved with offline main numbered entries for almost two decades, or they have never been involved with an offline Final Fantasy game at all. This has been spoken about in the most simplest form as to whether you're a left-sided Final Fantasy fan or a right-sided Final Fantasy fan, as per a diagram curated by Dreambaum and it has led to much debate. This debate has then been made a bit more complicated by Grooving in a Pict, who broke the lineage of various teams down a bit further. But for the sake of this video, we're going to boil things down into their most basic values, to show how the leadership team are connected with each other and why their bonds might run deeper than you would expect. At the top of the tree, we have Naoki Yoshida and Hiroshi Takai, who are serving as the producer and director of Final Fantasy 16 respectively. They will be joined by Kazutoyo Maihiro, the creative director and writer of the original screenplay, Hiroshi Minagawa, the art director, Michael Christopher Koji Fox, the localization director, Kazuya Takahashi, the character designer, Ryota Suzuki, the combat director, and Masayoshi Soken, the main composer. Over the past 30 years, each of these individuals has held various positions within the video games industry, and there has been a lot of crossover but their close working relationship has mostly been forged within the past 15 years. Yoshida has only worked on one previous Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy XIV. Before that, he worked as chief designer on Dragon Quest X and oversaw the Dragon Quest Monster Battle Road series. 
It would be when working on Dragon Quest X that Yoshida would come to know Hiroshi Menegawa, as during the project's initial development phase, he served as the technical design supervisor. They would then be reconnected, at least from the perspective of the general public, as part of Final Fantasy XIV's task force, where they would be joined by Hiroshi Takai. Takai had previously worked on Final Fantasy V and Final Fantasy XI, before being assigned as the director of The Last Remnant, where he worked with Kazutoyo Maihiro, who served as the main battle system designer. Once that project finished up, all four would then be assigned to work on a new IP that was never announced to the public and was ultimately cancelled. According to Yoshida, this new IP was meant to be a Bloodborne-esque action game, with systems similar to Evolve. However, it was cancelled in favour of them focusing all their efforts on Final Fantasy XIV. It means that their core tie is therefore Final Fantasy XIV, but all four did work on that cancelled IP, with Yoshida and Minagawa working on Dragon Quest X before that, and Takai and Maihiro working on The Last Remnant. Prior to working on that cancelled IP, Square Enix also had Yoshida, Takai and Minagawa sent together on research missions to Europe. The plan was that they were to report back on practices that could help other development teams adapt better to HD development, but from a personal perspective, it also helped to strengthen their bond. Michael Christopher Koji Fox, Kazuya Takahashi, and Masayoshi Soken are newer parts of the equation. Koji Fox worked on Final Fantasy XI, but only after Takai had left the production team. And although he would work on numerous projects including Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings, there was limited crossover until he started working on Final Fantasy XIV. Takahashi would also join Final Fantasy XI at the same time as Koji Fox, becoming a core part of the team until leaving to join the Final Fantasy XIV team, and Masayoshi Soken had taken on numerous roles prior to joining the original XIV team, but had never had any official credits cross paths with those who are now his close colleagues. The odd one out is then Ryota Suzuki. Out of the core leadership team, Suzuki is the only member who has not worked on Final Fantasy XIV, joining Square specifically to work on Final Fantasy XVI, and it's an interesting move. Based on the cancelled IP, Yoshida and his core group must have felt confident that they could make a compelling action game, but they have chosen to seek outside help to ensure the battle system of XVI is compelling, having been impressed by Suzuki's extensive list of credits, which includes Devil May Cry 5, Dragon's Dogma, and numerous titles within the Marvel vs. Capcom and Capcom vs. SNK sub-franchises. And based on what we're about to run through, it seems to have been a shrewd move. Final Fantasy XVI is very much an action RPG, with a strong focus on the action. But due to some smart design choices, it still has fundamental connections with the typical Final Fantasy experience. One of the most intriguing choices is around the pseudo-difficulty options. Whereas the Final Fantasy VII Remake opted for more traditional difficulty options, ranging from easy to hard, with Classic Mode introduced as an option for those who preferred a command-based experience, Final Fantasy XVI has taken a very different approach. It will see just two options provided, story-focused and action-focused. But what's intriguing is that neither will change difficulty in the traditional sense of giving monsters boosted attributes and harder movesets. Instead, difficulty now has a fundamental connection with the very ethos of what you'd experience within a traditional Final Fantasy game. In the past, games like Final Fantasy VII, X and XII did not have difficulty settings. How difficult the game was would depend on the player. If they wanted an easier ride, so they could focus more on the story, they could either grind or acquire powerful weapons, armor and accessories that would give them an advantage. If they wanted to make things harder, they could then implement their own restrictions, such as choosing not to use the junction system in Final Fantasy VIII. And that's the exact approach Final Fantasy XVI has taken. But when selecting story focused, instead of making the player work to gain those advantages, they're made available from the outset through the notion of assistance rings. These rings have been designed so that they can adapt the gameplay experience to suit each player, and this relates to helping people who are perhaps not as comfortable with action games, or those who just want to focus their efforts on specific aspects of the gameplay experience. For example, equipping the Ring of Timely Healing will grant players the Auto Potion ability. 
getting granular, the auto potion ability has been associated with Final Fantasy for a very long time. It could be learnt by the chemist class in Final Fantasy Tactics, and it has often been seen as a positive enhancement, allowing players to use potions whenever taking damage without having to waste a turn. This ability would then reappear within Final Fantasy VIII, IX and X, and gambits could be created within Final Fantasy XII to perform a similar function. It also appeared via an accessory called Doctor's Code in Crisis Core and Final Fantasy XIII. In other words, within a traditional Final Fantasy experience, using this ability would not have a negative connotation. Instead, it will be seen as gaining an advantage to make progression easier. Within Final Fantasy XVI, the Ring of Timely Healing will provide the exact same function, allowing players to automatically use a potion on Clive should his health get too low. Another pertinent example is the Ring of Timely Evasion. From a defensive standpoint, the ability to evade has often been one of the most important factors throughout the history of Final Fantasy. Instead of defending, this allows players to avoid all damage, and it's often associated with ninjas and thieves. Accessories that boost evasion are prevalent throughout the franchise as a result, and some games have even taken things further by having purposeful abilities that guarantee evasion, such as Evade Encounter within Final Fantasy X and Perfect Dodge in Final Fantasy XI. Within the action RPG genre, being able to evade is quite an important part of the battle system, and Final Fantasy XVI has a purposeful evade button for this reason. However, by using the Ring of Timely Evasion, Clive will automatically evade the majority of incoming attacks, allowing players to focus their time and effort on the offensive side of things instead. In many ways, it provides a similar function to the auto-evade plugin chip from Nier Automata or the Black Cowl in Final Fantasy XV, but instead of having to punish yourself by completing the Pityos Ruins or playing on easy difficulty, the Ring of Timely Evasion is accessible to the player right from the off. In addition to these two rings, there will be another three, each offering different ways to modify the challenge. For those who aren't as comfortable with playing action RPGs, the Ring of Timely Strikes will simplify combat by allowing lavish combinations to be performed by pressing just one button, as opposed to having to worry about all the different trigger points, elemental weaknesses and cooldowns. From a functional perspective, perhaps the closest match here would be how offensive actions could be taken within the command synergy battle system that was used in Final Fantasy XIII and XIII II. It means you will still be able to set Clive up in the way you want in terms of the abilities that can be used and the icons that are equipped, but the offensive actions taken by Clive will be automatically determined by the AI depending on the situation being encountered. The Ring of Assistance will assign commands to Clive's companion, Torgle, automatically and the Ring of Timely Focus will act as a slightly less extreme version of the Ring of Timely Evasion, slowing down time whenever Clive is in danger of being struck by an enemy, so that the player has an elongated window through which they can evade. It means there are numerous options available. You can embrace automation by equipping the Ring of Timely Evasion and the Ring of Timely Strikes, or you could go more subtle, equipping the Ring of Timely Assistance and the Ring of Timely Healing to take care of the more administrative tasks. Either way, by pulling from how accessories and abilities would typically be used within a standard Final Fantasy experience, the rings feel accommodating and empowering without being patronising, and instead of making the game easier by using them, it's more that it makes the game more challenging should the player choose to play without them. Outside of the rings, the player can also acquire other accessories that can boost attributes and amongst other things, enhance abilities and Clive will also be able to change his sword, sash and vambrace to fulfil a similar task. But this is where it makes sense to talk about the impressive level of detail featured throughout, and spend more time talking about how purposeful everything feels. And perhaps the best place to start is with the attributes. Clive will have 6 attributes, but 3 of them, when combined with equipment boosts, have a direct influence on the other 3. Attack is influenced by strength, Defense is influenced by vitality, and Stagger is influenced by will. The first two pairs of attributes are pretty obvious, as they relate to how much damage Clive will do and how much damage Clive will receive, but the third pair of attributes are more unique. We've talked before about how Final Fantasy XVI will feature a Stagger system, just like the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy and the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but how it's described this time is much more brutal. It means that instead of being called a stagger bar, it's called the will gauge, and this is because it relates directly to your opponent's will to continue fighting. Break their will, and they will be staggered, unable to fight back. 
and the stagger and will attributes will determine how effective Clive is at breaking the will of stronger opponents. It's a subtle change in terms of the language, but it's a purposeful one. In many ways, it feels emblematic of everything else that was seen within the demo, and it's evidenced in numerous ways. For example, even though this will be common for those who play Final Fantasy XIV, in many previous Final Fantasy games, a potion is an item that simply restores a small amount of HP. In Final Fantasy XVI, a potion is a curative fusion of common herbs found throughout Valisthea, used to treat frontline soldiers as an alternative to the Barber's Blade. It's a small snapshot, but it's clear that Koji Fox and his team must have been in their element when pulling everything together. You can see how much care and attention has been placed on every single tiny detail, and in many ways, it felt like trawling through the world of Final Fantasy Mirage Manual, just instead of sass, it's full of rich lore that can help to explain exactly what kind of experience people who play Final Fantasy XVI can expect to see. There was also plenty of visual and audio storytelling. The core of the demo was focused on Clive progressing through a medieval themed castle, so it's difficult to say how the rest of Final Fantasy XVI translates in this regard, but the setting was rammed full of tiny details. It also felt like a quintessential Final Fantasy dungeon, but evolved. Exposition would be delivered while progressing through the dungeon via in-game cutscenes and general conversations while traversing. This would then be interspersed with a mixture of what can only be described as modern day random encounters against lesser enemies, and mid-bosses of varying degrees of difficulty. Small pockets of exploration were also possible, just like in those classic Final Fantasy dungeons that featured hidden passages. But what was perhaps most impressive was how frequent the exposition was, and how necessary it felt. And it meant that even though the demo was akin to a vertical slice, with no real context for the story that took place, what happened pulled no punches, and it was engrossing. The dungeon setting itself was also just as much a part of the storytelling. The fighting would spill from close quarters to much bigger environments, and areas off the beaten path were also accessible, albeit in limited quantities, allowing players to find crafting items and small treasures, and the chance to learn more about the lore through small visual details. Now, based on this small snapshot, it's difficult to tell how much was procedural and how much was purposeful. It's also difficult to tell whether this cherry-picked sequence will be representative of the overarching narrative. But despite traversing through the castle for some time, nothing felt similar or recursive. The various boss encounters, which were of increasing scale and difficulty, complemented the narrative exposition, and when combined with the dark, dank atmosphere and the ambient and adaptive soundtrack, it was easy to get sucked in and driven forward. Another crucial part of the experience was the gameplay, and due to how crucial this aspect is, we're going to spend quite a bit of time running through how everything works. To note, for this particular demo, which was created specifically for the event that we attended, access was granted to abilities that would not normally be available at this point in the story. It's therefore not 100% representative of what the final experience will be like. And if we're making a comparison, it's kind of like the Final Fantasy VIII demo, where Renoa joins Squall and Zell for the Dolat mission, and they also had access to Leviathan. To be honest, having access to so many abilities right off the bat was a little overwhelming but it was also necessary given how little time there was to try and highlight just how much depth the gameplay experience will grow to have. In the final product, thanks to the progression system, it's clear the players will have time to get accustomed to the various abilities as they advance through the story. Progression will then be based on how players spend Clive's ability points, and points can be spent to learn, upgrade, and then master numerous abilities that are split into two separate camps abilities that Clive is able to use innately, and abilities that Clive can access via iconic enhancements, and these distinctions are very important. Focusing on Clive, there were 14 separate abilities featured within the demo, and these ranged from affording Clive the ability to jump, perform a basic sword combo and cast magic, through to some more advanced moves. What's interesting is that even before getting to the flashy and devastating icon abilities, Clive will have plenty of ways to deal damage and avoid damage. The default melee attack ability can be used to create a 4 hit combo, but there is also additional applications. Performing a melee attack with the right timing point can parry an incoming attack, slowing down time so that Clive can take advantage to land unanswerable blows. 
The standard melee attack can also be combined with the standard magic attack to create a magic burst. And if done with the correct timing point and without interruptions, this can be used to create an 8 hit combo. Another of Clive's important abilities will be the dodge. Not only can this be used as a go-to way of avoiding incoming damage, Clive can also cast magic while dodging. And if the timing is correct, Clive will perform a precision dodge, opening the window for either a melee or magical counter. This then opens the door for what may seem like a more specialised ability, Taunt. It's important to note that throughout the demo, Clive was assisted by Sid as an AI companion. And you may be thinking, why would it be beneficial to use Taunt when attentions are split between two characters instead of every opponent focusing on one? Well, that would be because taunting provides more opportunities to land parries and perfect dodges, and those who are more comfortable with action RPGs and have enjoyed mastering games like Neuro Automata and Bayonetta can use this to their advantage. Clive can also use more specialised abilities, such as Lunge and Burning Blade. Lunge will allow Clive to close the distance from afar, while Burning Blade can be used to either break the guard of stronger enemies or start combos by launching enemies into the air. And this then leads to the jump ability. Clive can jump to meet launched enemies, landing strikes in midair before finishing them off with another ability called down thrust. If launching isn't an option, Clive can also use stomp to kick off bigger enemies, striking their upper extremities. There's also the option to perform a swift recovery when taking damage to reduce knockback, and even allow Clive to parry while falling back, putting him straight on the offensive. And with each of these abilities having their applications enhanced through upgrading and mastery, it highlights just how much depth there is even within the basic toolkit. Icon abilities then add an extra layer of depth. As has been shown within many of the previous trailers, Clive will be able to wield the power of icons. They will allow him to deal huge amounts of damage with varying utility, but the iconic affinity will also affect regular gameplay, as each icon has an ability that can be accessed as part of Clive's standard arsenal used by pressing the circle button. Two other abilities can then be accessed by pressing the RT button, overlaying Clive's standard melee and magic attacks when the trigger is held. But unlike Clive's regular abilities, which can be used indefinitely, these two iconic abilities have specific cooldowns due to how powerful they are in comparison. Having cooldowns may sound counterintuitive within an action RPG, as it has the potential to make combat less free-flowing and dynamic. But as the game progresses, Clive can wield the power of multiple icons at the same time, with those powerful abilities having independent cooldown timers. It means by using L2 to cycle through, players can control the tempo, and either space abilities out, using them when required, or saving them up for pivotal moments and unloading a barrage of damage. Within the demo, access was granted to three specific pools of iconic abilities, Phoenix, Garuda, and Titan. And what's pleasing to see is that they each promote different playstyles. Phoenix, for example, has its standard ability as Phoenix Shift. This allows players to rapidly close the distance and perform a combination strike. Another of the abilities is Heat Wave, which allows Clive to perform a long distance fire-based attack so one can easily be used to follow up the other. Garuda has its standard ability as Deadly Embrace. Acting as almost the opposite of Phoenix Strike, it allows Clive to tether onto enemies, pulling them closer. But if the enemy is too big, Deadly Embrace becomes Deadly Leap, launching Clive into the air so that a mid-air combination can be initiated. The more powerful abilities are then a mixture of rapid fire close quarters damage that can be used to launch smaller enemies into the air. Titan is then quite different. Its default ability is Guard, which when used, blocks almost all incoming damage. If done at the right time, Guard becomes Precision Guard, which allows Clive to perform three devastating counterattacks. Titan's more powerful abilities also require more focus from the player, as unlike Phoenix and Garuda, holding the button down and releasing at the correct timing point will either increase the range of the ability or the damage associated to it. That so much variety was featured within the abilities associated with just these three icons was pleasing to see, especially as some abilities were not even unlockable. It also opened up the door for potential combinations and advanced play. For example, players can utilize Taunt and then land Precision Guard to deal devastating counters on a mass scale. They could also use Phoenix Shift to close the distance on large enemies, switching to Garuda to use Deadly Leap to kickstart a mid-air combination that ends with down thrust. On top of this, there's also the limit breaks. 
When landing strikes, Clyde's limit break gauge will increase, but it will also increase based on other criteria, such as preventing damage via Titan's guard ability. When unleashed, Clive will deal huge amounts of damage. And that then brings us back to the stagger system. Alongside Clive's stagger ability, which will allow for the breaking of larger opponents' will more quickly, each ability also has ratings associated with their damage potential and their effectiveness at breaking will. For larger enemies, there are also so many fun things that can be done. For example, if the stagger bar is at 50%, Deadly Embrace can be used to drag them to the ground, leaving them vulnerable for a short period. When staggered, players also need to be strategic. Dealing damage makes opponents more resolute, and after a certain period of time has passed, they will regain their will to continue the fight. But the closer they are to regaining their will, then the more damage Clive will deal, with the damage boost being 1.05 times at the start of the stagger and 1.5 times at the end. It should also be stressed that players can respect their abilities at any time, returning all the points to the pool. This can be done on an ability by ability basis, but all abilities can be returned at the same time should the player wish. In addition, there's also a nice feature to lock specific abilities, something that prevents them from being part of any respec. To make use of this huge array of abilities, the demo provided a few different types of encounter. The so-called random encounters that were mentioned earlier in the video would see Clio square off against groups of weaker enemies. Just as in a regular dungeon, these won't provide too much of a challenge, but strategic elements were still present. This would see some encounters feature melee infantry, while others featured mages that could heal their allies and cast offensive spells. Heavy infantry would also feature, able to block Clive's attacks from the front, and additional strategy would come from where the encounters took place, as some would be in small enclosed areas and some would be in much bigger spaces. The frequency of encounters and exploration felt good in terms of pacing, as did the increase in difficulty of the encounters themselves. Even when encountering what can only be described as a mini-boss, the regular encounters that followed would then continue to ramp up in terms of the challenge they offered. Progressing further, the dungeon's mid-boss would then see things heightened even further, while also introducing quick-time events. Cinematic evasion and cinematic strike will have a close relationship, requiring the player to press the correct button prompt within the specified time. There will also be a third type of cinematic action that will then require the player to mash the button to deal damage. This mid-boss encounter would then pose quite a different challenge to the final boss of the dungeon. Both would be multi-stage encounters, but the boss at the end of the sequence will be much more cinematic, and this then plays to the strengths of Final Fantasy XV. Yoshida has been keen to stress that by levering the power of the PlayStation 5, Final Fantasy XVI will be able to switch between action sequences and story sequences without the player even noticing. And within this encounter, that was quite apparent. Everything moved at a breakneck pace, with parts of the environment being smashed to pieces as the encounter progressed and cinematic sequences being interspliced with the action. This encounter also showed how malleable the gameplay is. Throughout the different combat scenarios proposed within the demo, which varied from fights against small hordes of enemies through to one-on-one -on -one encounters that stripped away the AR companion and even toggle for small parts, abilities didn't ever feel overpowered or underpowered. It suggested a lot of time and effort have been placed on balancing, no small feat considering how easily the aforementioned rings can change the power dynamic. Beyond this small segment, the demo also showcased encounters that would be of an even greater scale. The first would see Clive square off against a full-sized icon, and the second would see players take control of an icon themselves to try and finish the fight. Both of these encounters felt very different in comparison to the flow of the dungeon, and that was because they both posed more unique strategic challenges. In the initial instance, Clive would need to exploit his small size to get into blind spots, all the while making sure to avoid huge sweeping attacks. In the latter instance, it was all about raw power. Yoshida has said numerous times that the developers have worked hard to make these fights feel special. It means that no two encounters should feel the same, and for this particular encounter, it was a real slugfest. Yoshida has described it as being akin to a pro wrestling match, and it's quite clear to see why, as the gameplay felt more simplified, but the impact felt more extreme. There was also a heavier emphasis on quick time events as the fight drew on, and although this could be seen as a negative from a gameplay perspective, from a narrative perspective, it felt like the right decision to make. All things considered, the demo featured a ton of variety, an apt showcase for what's to come. The only questions that remain, really, will relate to how well this transfers through to the final product. And that brings us on to the future. 
Final Fantasy 16 is due to launch on the 22nd of June, exclusively on the PlayStation 5. That's less than 4 months away. The demo gave a real taste for what the final product will look like from a gameplay perspective, while also offering a glimpse at the tone of the narrative. Both of those two things combined will offer a distinct shift away from what is often seen within a typical Final Fantasy game, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Final Fantasy has always been about evolution, and what we're seeing here represents that evolution. In reality, Final Fantasy has not been a traditional turn-based game for quite some time now, with many of the games released in the past 20 years each pushing the very definition of what it means to be turn-based. The Final Fantasy VII Remake served as a quite genius happy medium, incorporating the now famed ATB system into one that was action-based, and although the developers working on Final Fantasy VI did not choose to build upon that, what they've created works well. And the hope must be that by incorporating the assistance rings in the way they have, certain fears will be allayed in terms of difficulty or a lack of familiarity with action-based games. From a narrative perspective, things will be quite dark. But lest we forget that Final Fantasy has often towed the line here. Final Fantasy Tactics was a very dark narrative, as was Final Fantasy Type-0. And even the mainline games have dealt with very harsh subjects, it's just that they have often glossed over them in a way that Final Fantasy XVI seems like it will not do. This may catch some people by surprise, and it's hard to tell how this will pan out based on what was showcased within the demo, but the hope is there that the narrative will be strong, leaving a positive, lasting impression. And that just about wraps up our impressions from the special Final Fantasy XVI demo that we were very fortunate to experience. Hopefully, it was extensive enough to give you a proper flavour for what to expect within the final game, with the various aspects we covered either providing clarity or allaying fears that may have existed. On that note, I'd like to just give a huge thank you to everyone who has supported the channel over the years. The journey has been long, but it's been worth it, and we just hope that we can continue to deliver on your expectations, whether that's by providing detailed and extensive coverage like this, or within our documentaries or other long-form content. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Galcian D. Kajata, Gregory, Justin Dent, Lord of Morning, and Zukan TDK, who are Super Special Onion Eye supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.